Welcome to the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City. In this series, Karen Armstrong, Oliver Sacks, Mike Nichols, Bill Viola, Ken Burns, Philip Glass, Sandra Bernhardt, Michael Cunningham, Robert Wilson, Laurie Anderson, and Peter Sellers have come to the museum to talk about nothing to celebrate the exhibition Grain of Emptiness. In this session, actress Fiona Shaw meets with philosopher Simon Critchley to explore nothingness in the works of Ibsen, Beckett, and T.S. Eliot. So what does nothing mean to you, Fiona? Everything. <laughs> um, as I was walking here tonight, I was thinking about nothing, thinking, um, where does nothing occur? Uh, in, in, uh, in pieces that I've done. And uh, a few just dropped into my head, but uh, as Tim was giving the introduction, I was reminded about a sort of nothing story that Jean Calman told me about a friend of his, a very old man, who was um, a dancer in Japan and whose mother was dying. So this must be going back about two centuries. But anyway, the, uh, the mother was dying and she, in Japanese, she kept on saying to her son on her deathbed, I'm a flounder, I'm a flounder. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't understand what his mother meant. Mm -hmm. When the mother died, he invented a dance based on his mother's life because he loved her. And so he began as a flounder. And he had this revelation as he made this dance that a flounder lies at the very bottom of the sea, you know, flattened by the sea and can't bear the weight. I suppose the dying lady felt this. But slowly, you know, with just a sort of flip of the end of the tip of the wings or, or, or gills or the, you know, the wings of the flounder, just began to move. And again, slowly, of course, began to float to the sea. And Jean told me that story really as the basis of where all art should begin um, with nothing at the bottom of the sea, mm -hmm. flattened. And I am designing figure at the moment with uh, Peter McIntosh, the designer who's with me now, and we've spent the day just sort of looking at a box with often nothing in our heads. And it's a, <laughs> but it's a very, it's not a bad place to be. There's a phrase of Heidegger's, I was having a sort of nervous breakdown my first year at university. Uh, I didn't How think glamorous. I should, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I didn't think I should be there. I couldn't work out what anything meant. And, you know, I felt out of place, terrible anxiety. But then I read this uh, essay by Heidegger called What is Metaphysics? In this essay called What is Metaphysics, he says, uh, it's a phrase, anxiety reveals the nothing. Right? And this spoke to me in an extraordinary way. I didn't know what it meant necessarily. But anxiety reveals the nothing. And what Heidegger was talking, and this, this spoke to me in a very direct sort of existential way, was the anxiety is that feeling of everything becoming nothing of things slipping away, of the, the things which you, the familiar, the homely, um, everything that you've been told was, was meaningful, slipping away, disappearing, becoming intangible, cold, the cold, the pale fire of anxiety he talks about. And, um, and this is being, uh, for him, the fundamentally philosophical disposition, this anxiety that reveals the nothing, and also a definition of what we are, we are, Nothing. And also, there's a question of nothing in Beckett, which is sort of all over the place. And I know he means a lot to you. Uh, he, he's amazing, Beckett, because uh, he really, I, I never had a more unhappy time rehearsing a play. Uh, it, it was absolutely impossible. Um, uh, and I, 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 I floundered because I learned things, funnily enough, through images. I, I can see the picture of the thing I'm saying. Um, I can just see it. So, uh, and so, you know, obviously something at like the wasteland is an absolute doddle compared to Beckett. Right. You know, right. April is the cruelest month you can see. You know, breeding lilacs out of the dead land. You can see them mixing memories. <laughs> but with Beckett going, you know, another heavenly day for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. World without end. Amen. Um, mm. Begin, Winnie. Begin your day, Winnie. Uh, you know, there is no image. Uh, they're just the fragments between images. But when I began to play it the person who came through and the rhythm of it, I liked very, very much. And instead of a sort of cold, hard look that you feel that Beckett was giving humanity, I think he loves Winnie, and I think he loves us. I mean, he, yes. you know, one thinks that Beckett is so tough on us, and actually, I think there's something uh, very generous about him, because he celebrates our nothingness. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, sub previously to playing Winnie, I had played in um, Footfalls many years ago. It's a fantastic piece. And it's a fantastic piece yeah. because uh, there he explores nothing. And it seems to me, I've always said this to students actually, that uh, you jump from Ibsen to Brecht mm. to Beckett because in Ibsen you have people, as I just mentioned earlier, not using the same verbs to each other, really being suspicious that the other person may be lying. In Brecht, you have characters, actors, not being who they say they are. So the actors are not connected to the parts they're playing. And then you get to Beckett, where the characters may or may not exist. And, and modern film writing, of course, has become the, the great sort of form of the inarticulate. So that instead of, <laughs> I, I don't mean, I guess, I mean, that, that the, you know, the pause has become the, the person unable to say something. And we have made a language out of it now. So, I mean, a lot of young girls you hear is going, you know, I, so I sort of, you know, you know, oh my God. I just feel so, you know, I just, oh my God. And, and the other person is only going, I know. And they do know. Totally, that's right. They're communicating entirely going, so I just said to him, I just said, oh my God, I, I can't. Oh. No, you didn't. I, yep. So they're not saying anything at all. They're just, they're just chopping, they're chopping the electricity that might have happened had they completed a thought, and they're just exchanging electrical charges, going, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, you know, the uh, ge generation bubble will have no clue what they're saying, but they know, because they know the kind of vibe. So True. you can't blame the girls going, so I said, oh my God, it's great, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, because they, they are at least exchanging the infusion of energy. So I think writers, good writers, can catch, catch that, don't they? They catch that. You see, what fascinates me about theatre is that um, uh, for two and a half thousand years, it's never been clear what this damn thing means. We're presented with the most fundamental conflicts which constitute society. Right? Some, for whatever reason, we don't know why, well, there are speculations on why the Greeks initiated the city Dionysia and all of that, but what they presented were the, the fundamental tensions that constituted who they were. And they didn't present resolutions of those things, they presented problems. So theatre was the presentation of society as a problem, as a question, not as the answer to a question. And so theatre for me has always been the repository of that, that questioning, whether it's Ibsen or Beckett or whatever. Long may it continue. Rhythm is the key to the unconscious in all writing. Mm. Uh, Peter and I, who are just doing this figure at the moment, it's the rhythm will tell you anything that's really interesting about what's, about what's going on. So if a character in Shakespeare says, pay him 6,000 and deface the bond, double 6,000 and then treble that before a friend of this description shall lose a f hair to Bassanio's throat. <laughs> And if the word hair is the one word that doesn't scan, that is the most important word in right, the line. Right. You can't analyze it, and you can't lecture on it. You can only hear it. And your job as the actress is to serve it. Really, it doesn't matter who you are, the actor or actress. It really doesn't. It's very sad for the actor or actress. <laughs> the exciting thing for the actor or actress or any of us as persons is that the rhythm with which we speak in our daily lives is usually an inherited rhythm from our culture. So in America, it's a very, very even rhythm because people are making sure that they hit solid ground due to the enforcement of this language being pushed onto people whose natural language it was probably not. So the American tendency is towards the noun. They say dog, pizza. Money, car, job, war. And they do not waste too much time. They're very straightforward. Coffee. I mean, it's just marvelous. Coffee is a whole sentence. It's, mm -hmm. I'm desperate for a coffee and I'll die if I don't have one before breakfast. <laughs> but they don't bother with all of that. And, you know, in, 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 in England, people speak on a G major chord. So they're always saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. An American is going to be or not to be, that's the question. And an Irish person is going to be an Irish person. <laughs> <laughs> a French person is speaking on four beats. So they are not speaking on the iambic pentameter. They're only speaking on four beats. So their tendency is to say, to be or not to be, that is. Mm.
<laughs> an, African, an African person or West Indian person would tend to speak on six beats. So their tendency rhythmically is to say to be or not to be, that is the question, man. <laughs> there will always be a silent man or a syncopation waiting at the end of their inherited language base. So when we come to speak anything, whether it's Beckett or Shakespeare or Yeats or Emily Dickinson, or, you're speaking from your national rhythm. You're then also speaking from the peculiar rhythms of your family or the dynamics within it. And a tiny yeah. little bit of it is you. Is you. <laughs> and uh, that's what makes us individual, this tiny little bit. But most of it, 99% of it, is a shared thing. And that maybe is what makes the communality or the possibility of theatre possible. Yeah. In fact, when people say, I'm a star because I'm so individual, it's the last thing that people want you to be. They want you to be, really, you should really try yeah. and be part of the entire amazing mesh of universality with just a punctuation mark that allows it to be heard. <laughs>